Hello everyone from WHO headquarters here in Geneva. My name is Tarek and I welcome you for a regular press conference on COVID-19. Welcome to everyone watching us on a number of WHO social media platforms and to all journalists who are uh, following us on Zoom. Journalists who are online uh, have the possibility to listen this briefing with simultaneous interpretation in six UN languages mm -hmm. plus Portuguese plus Hindi. Journalists also may ask their questions in those six languages plus uh, Portuguese. Uh, today with us, uh, we have uh, Director General Dr. Tedros, we have Dr. Maria Van Kerkhove, we have Dr. Mike Ryan, and we have our special guest, uh, Professor Thomas Zeltner, that uh, Director General will introduce in more uh, details. Uh, before I give a floor to Dr. Tedros, I would just like to uh, thank the interpreters who are uh, with us here today, and also to ask journalists who want to ask questions to uh, raise hand, and uh, uh, that's why they will be put in line. And I will remind everyone that we would like to have a concise questions and one question per journalist. And now I will give the floor to Dr. Tedros. Thank you. Thank you, Tariq. Uh, Tariq didn't join us on Monday because it was his birthday. So happy birthday for Monday <laughs> for Tariq. Thank you, thank you, uh, Tariq. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Yesterday, 40 million health professionals sent a letter to the leaders of each of the G20 nations calling for a healthy and green recovery from COVID-19. I fully support this. The human cost of COVID-19 has been devastating, and the so-called lockdown measures have turned lives upside down. But the pandemic has given us a glimpse of what our world could look like if we took the bold steps that are needed to curb climate change and air pollution. Our air and water can be cleaner, our streets can be quieter and safer, and many of us have found new ways to work while spending more time with our families. Yesterday, WHO published our manifesto for a green and healthy recovery from COVID-19 with six simple prescriptions. First, protect nature, which is the source of the air, water, and food on which human health depends. Second, Ensure that homes and health facilities have water and sanitation, access to clean and reliable energy, and are resilient to climate change. Third, invest in a quick transition to clean energy that will cut air pollution, so that when COVID-19 has been defeated, people can breathe clean air. Fourth, promote healthy and sustainable food systems to give people access to healthy and affordable food. Fifth, build cities that integrate health into all aspects of urban planning, from sustainable transport systems to healthy housing. And sixth, stop subsidizing fossil fuels that cause pollution and drive climate change. As some countries start to reopen their societies and economies, the question we must answer is whether we will just return to the way things were or whether we will learn the lessons the pandemic is teaching us about our relationship with our planet. Building back better means building back greener. When I started as Director General Almost three years ago, one of the first things I do, did was to put out a call to all staff to contribute ideas for how to transform WHO and make it more effective. And I was asking many of my colleagues, saying, please generate crazy ideas to transform our organization. One of the ways I did that was by instituting open hour where any staff member can come to talk to me about any issue they want every Thursday afternoon. 
these ideas became the basis of the transformation process we have been implementing over the past few years. And I would like to use this opportunity to thank all staff who contributed their ideas that are now changing the face of WHO. At one of the first meetings, a staff member proposed the creation of a WHO foundation. The idea was to establish a way to generate funding for WHO from sources we haven't tapped before, including the general public. Until now, WHO has been one of the few international organizations which has not received donations from the general public. I immediately recognized the enormous potential in this idea, thanks to the staff who suggested this idea. It's well documented that one of the greatest threats to WHO success is the fact that less than 20% of our budget comes in the form of flexible access contribution from member states, while more than 80% is voluntary contributions from member states and other donors, which are usually tightly earmarked for specific programs. In effect, that means WHO has little discretion over the way it spends its funds, almost 80% of its funds. We have been working hard to encourage member states to increase the proportion of flexible funds they give us. And we, have very, we are very grateful for those countries that have given us greater flexibility in recent years. And there is improvement. But for WHO to fulfill its mission and mandate, there is a clear need to broaden our donor base and to improve both the quantity and quality of funding we receive, meaning more flexible funding. Since February 2018, we have been hard at work supporting the establishment of the WHO Foundation. And today, after a hard work of two years, more than two years, it gives us enormous pleasure to launch it officially, to launch the WHO Foundation. This is a historic step for WHO as an integral part of our resource mobilization strategy to broaden the contributor base. The WHO Foundation was not ready to launch when the COVID-19 pandemic began. So with the support of the United Nations Foundation, the Swiss Philanthropy Foundation, and several other partners, we launched the COVID-19 Solidarity Response Fund. In just two and a half months, this fund has raised more than 214 million US dollars from more than 400,000 individuals and companies, including $55 million from the One World Together at Home virtual concert. These funds have been used to buy lab diagnostics, personal protective equipment, and to fund research and development, including for vaccines. The Solidarity Response Fund is powerful proof of concept for the WHO Foundation. To further promote the Solidarity Response Fund, WHO has partnered with the Animation Studio Illumination to launch a public, uh, public service announcement today aimed at children featuring the beloved animated characters, the Minions and Gru, voiced by the actor Steve Carroll to promote ways for people to stay safe from COVID-19. The Solidarity Response Fund will continue to receive donations to support WHO's work on COVID-19, while the WHO Foundation will help to fund all elements of WHO's work and be fully aligned with our priorities. It now gives me great pleasure to introduce Professor Thomas Zeltner, 
who is the founder and chair of the board of the WHO Foundation. Professor Zeltner is a Swiss physician and lawyer with a long and distinguished career in public health, including as the Director General of the National Health Authority and as Swiss Secretary of State for Health. Professor Zeltner, thank you for your support and collaboration over the past 18 months. And the floor is yours to speak about the new WHO Foundation, which is being born today. Thank you, Professor. Well, thank you so much, much uh, Dr. Tedros, for welcoming me here in Geneva. And it's really an honor, and I'm very pleased to have the opportunity uh, to speak on this topic today. It is important, and in, uh, indeed in a very important day. And uh, I'm very thrilled to announce the creation, the formal creation of the WHO Foundation. What I will do is address in five key points briefly uh, the following points. A, first, what is the WHO Foundation? Secondly, why is it needed? Third, how will it make a difference? Fourth, what is the relation between the Foundation and WHO? And finally, uh, where are we today and what are the next steps? So, let me start with the first, what is the WHO Foundation? The Foundation is an independent grant-making organization set up under Swiss law. Its primary mission is to address the most pressing global health challenges of today and tomorrow by raising significant new funding for WHO from non-traditional sources. And I stress that from non-traditional sources. The foundation will work with individual major donors, with the general public, and with corporate partners to strengthen the global health ecosystem by supporting WHO's resource mobilization strategy, broaden WHO's donor base, and supporting its five-year strategy, uh, also known as the general program of work. Second, some may ask, why is this foundation needed? The creation of the foundation represents a truly innovative approach to diversify WHO's resource mobilization strategy. This new approach is clearly uh, an urgent need as illustrated by the tremendous response of the donation to the COVID-19 uh, Solidarity Response Fund uh, that uh, Dr. Tedros just alluded and showed how important it is. Uh, while uh, pandemic preparedness and response will also be one of the areas of the WHO Foundation, the Foundation's mission is much broader than this and will cover all areas of uh, global public health in which WHO is working. We will do this by supporting global public health needs from a wide range from prevention, mental health to non-communicable diseases, to emergency preparedness and to health system strengthening. Three, how will this foundation make a difference? Tercero, ¿cómo puede marcar la diferencia esta fundación? La fundación servirá para fortalecer y completar, no supl suplir, sino completar el ecosistema de salud mundial, dando flexibilidad y permitiendo recibir las contribuciones y reali realizar esas becas. Habrá intervenciones dirigidas y orientadas por la OMS que se concentrará y también se concentrará en las actividades 
eh, de alto impacto y en las alianzas. Queremos fortalecer la OMS, garantizar sincronización, apoyo, complementariedad y eso lo haremos en todos los ámbitos. Toda la financiación de la Fundación de la OMS ayudará a aplicar el Programa General de Trabajo de la Organización de la OMS. Entre un 70 y un 80% de los fondos que recaudemos se destinarán directamente a la Secretaría de la OMS y el 20-30% restante se usarán para mejorar, fortalecer la salud pública a nivel mundial y se trabajará así con todos los... What is the relation of the foundation with WHO? The foundation is an independent legal entity formed under the laws of Switzerland. The name is being licensed on a revocable basis in accordance with terms and conditions stipulated in an agreement between the WHO and the foundation. The foundation has been established and that's a legal requirement by me as a Swiss citizen in the canton of Gen uh, Geneva uh, here in close collaboration with WHO and supported by an independent philanthropic consulting firm. WHO will mean maintain close links with the foundation. In this regard, the director general will designate a representative to attend the board foundation meetings as an observer. WHO also uh, periodically will report to member states on its interaction with the foundation and funds received from it. All funding from the WHO foundation to WHO will be fully aligned with the program budget decided by member states and given as flexible and predictable as possible. The last point, what are the next steps for the Foundation? Why we have established a possibility to receive donations right now under a, a, a new uh, homepage, whofoundationproject.org, and I invite you to look at it and to feel free to donate. We currently are in the process of forming a secretariat for the foundation and starting the search of a CEO. In addition, we are in the process of expanding the board to include a prominent and diverse personalities from all uh, WHO regions. I am truly humbled and honored to be the founder of this initiative And thank you, Dr. Tedros, very much uh, for this opportunity, for your confidence and for all your support in launching this initiative, uh, which has been in the making for two years, as you mentioned. I would also like to thank uh, the advisory group uh, that has helped us in establishing uh, this uh, foundation. Very much thank you, all members of this group. We very much look forward now to engage with individual major donors, with the general public and corporate partners to tailor partnerships with the ultimate goal of supporting SDG 3 to help future generations to overcome health challenges of today and to thrive tomorrow. WHO deserves a strong independent external advocate who can support and strengthen its impact on global, in the global health ecosystem. And this foundation will do just that. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tedros and uh, Professor Zeltner. Now, Professor Zeltner and uh, Director General Dr. Tedros will sign the Memorandum of Understanding between WHO and WHO Foundation.
Many pages, huh? <laughs> Congratulations okay. to both uh, yeah. Professor Zeltner and to Director General for signing the Memorandum of Understanding between WHO and WHO Foundation. Thank you, and uh, now uh, we will uh, start uh, with our session with journalists on questions and answers. Uh, I will remind journalists that uh, they can listen uh, answers and they can ask uh, uh, their questions in six UN languages plus Portuguese, and they can also listen in Hindi, and we would like really if possible to have uh, short and concise questions. So we would start first uh, from our a uh, colleague based here in Geneva, Laurent Sierra from Swiss News. Laurent? Yeah, thanks, Tarek. Uh, can you hear me? Uh, yes, very well. Thank you, and thank you for taking my question. A question to, um, to Dr. Ted Ross on the new foundation that, just, uh, that was just launched. I know that it's an independent foundation, but given the, the recent tensions with the U.S. on the funding of, of the organization, uh, do you consider that as a model for future reforms of the funding structure of the organization in order to, to prevent in the future that one member state could jeopardize uh, the, the efforts of the organization? As I, as I said um, earlier, this had started uh, more than two years ago, um, and it came from one of our uh, colleagues, actually. Uh, as I said, it was, uh, I have this, what I call open, open door, open hour every Thursday in the afternoon, and our staff come and uh, see me to tell me any ideas they have to improve our organization. Uh, as you know, for any organization to serve the people they serve better, they have to evolve regularly. And in WHO, we consider change as a constant. And that's why staff anytime can come, not only two, three years ago, but even now they come every Thursday to, we have even started virtual now, uh, to talk to me, to give me advice. So uh, that's how we uh, got this uh, idea, and it's continuing. And when we started, when this idea came, uh, it, it really uh, was based on the problems we have been facing and we're still facing. Uh, most of the funding we get, which is 80%, is not flexible. 
it's earmarked, and our discretion to use it for based on uh, other priorities uh, is really limited. So that's why we said, I think in order to improve flexibility, we need to have additional resources and unearmarked resources, and this is uh, a good solution and we have to pursue. And not only it helps us, of course, to improve the quality of the funding we have, but we also knew that it can address the other problem we face, meaning most of the funding comes from a limited number of donors, the, especially the voluntary, and it can help us in broadening uh, the base, not only uh, the quality of uh, the funding uh, itself. And having additional uh, resources, especially, as Professor said, the funding will come from non-traditional, so it's a plus, a plus. And it increases the um, uh, sources of funding uh, we get. But not only that, um, we want also additional funding because uh, based on the transformation we had, uh, we need to invest uh, more in, in uh, programs, especially if you take the healthy population, one of the pillars we have, uh, which is uh, least uh, uh, funded. And this idea helps us, the WHO Foundation, to increase the volume to the quantity so we can expand our programs. And investing in healthy populations is really key uh, in promoting health. We have to actually, as WHO, focus on keeping people healthy. Our focus should not be in managing disease, but in preventing it from happening and in helping people to lead a healthy life. That's one area, actually, which is least funded, which addresses the root causes of the problem. This is the food we eat, the air we breathe, the environment we live in, and the other factors that uh, can bring ill health or can uh, keep us healthy. Investing in, their, uh, investing in promoting health is very important, and that's why the additional funding we can get through this foundation and, of course, other sources can help us also to really uh, invest in this one program, which is least funded, which we identified now based on the transformation as one pillar and the major pillar. Actually, we call it the entry pillar because that's the healthy population's promotion of health, which is the entry pillar and the most important. And the reform has been completed, the design part, by March 2019. And this was part of that design, and it was already one year in the process last year. So this, is, uh, this has many benefits, as I said, and it has nothing to do with the recent um, funding issues but this is something that started with the transformation that can help the organization or WHO to have to improve the quality of funding, to increase the amount of funding, to serve the people we serve in, in a better way. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Tedros. Uh, uh, so uh, we will try to go to the next question that comes from uh, Nicolas Norbrook from Jeune Afrique. Uh, Nicolas, you would need to unmute yourself. Can you hear me? Yes, Nicolas. Please go ahead. Great. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Um, many African governments are now starting to reopen their economies. What can they learn from uh, countries worldwide who have themselves already started to emerge from lockdown? Are there any cheap or, or low-tech versions of contact tracing that might be available to them, for example? And if not, um, how should they go about this uh, opening up? 
Thank you very much for the question. Um, indeed, there is a lot that all countries can learn from each other as we uh, learn about the virus, as we learn about uh, which control measures work and, and how they are implemented, as well as how many of these public health and social measures or so-called lockdowns are lifted. Uh, what we are learning from um, all countries that are starting to initiate the lifting of these measures is that they need to be done, the lifting of these measures need to be done in a slow and a staggered way. And it needs to be done using a data-driven approach, meaning um, do we have the infrastructure in place, the public health infrastructure in place to know where the virus is? Um, the low-tech solutions that you mention are people. They are the workforce that needs to be in place uh, to be able to find cases, to be able to test for those cases, uh, to be able to care for individuals um, who are infected with COVID-19, depending on the severity of their symptoms, and to be able to trace the contacts and quarantine the contacts. Um, and that needs uh, people. It needs a workforce uh, that is educated and trained um, that can, can perform those functions. There are apps that we have talked about before that can support that, um, but it doesn't eliminate the need for people. Um, what we are learning from those that are lifting uh, the lockdown is that the ones that can do this well, the ones that are, are, are teaching us, um, they have the public health infrastructure in place. So in, in several countries, in Asia, for example, in countries in Europe um, that are lifting these measures, um, what they're able to do is quickly identify cases and look at the metrics. How many cases are being detected? What do the, the bed occupancy look like? What are the numbers of deaths over time? What is the reproduction number? You know, there's certain criteria um, that need to be looked at. Um, and that is something that all countries can do. But the, the best advice we have seen, what we have learned, is that it needs to be done in a slow way. Not all measures can be lifted at once, um, certainly not nationwide. Um, taking a, an approach of looking at where is transmission uh, least, least um, and looking at that at a geographic level, but also doing it in a slow way. Um, yeah, and if I could I, I just maybe add here, uh, th there's sort of a perception that uh, all technology and all knowledge moves from north to south on this planet. Uh, in fact, when we look at something as fundamental to public health, and to stopping epidemics as uh, contact tracing. In fact, I think the South is teaching the North, or the North is rediscovering just how important core public health infrastructure, workforce, case finding, contact tracing, and simple quarantine measures are, and how central these are to stopping new viruses, respiratory viruses, other viruses like hemorrhagic fever viruses, for which we don't have treatments or vaccines. Our best protection against diseases for which we don't have uh, treatments or vaccines for which we understand some part of the transmission dynamic and where we can break the chains of transmission and we'd like to thank those uh, countries in the south particularly those countries who face these types of epidemics over the last number of years who've really honed uh, the techniques for efficient uh, uh, case finding and contact tracing um, and many of those techniques are in fact being reabsorbed into countries of, uh, of the north. Uh, another issue is uh, we have this perception that the, the public health part of the equation is the cheap and cheerful part, and then we have the health system part, and that's the sophisticated technological part, and that's what costs all the money. This is maybe one of the, the misconceptions. We have fundamentally underinvested in the public health architecture in all countries, north and south. Um, and many countries have found that when they went looking for the public health system, when they went looking for the public health workforce, when the system needed to quickly find cases, investigate clusters, track contacts, uh, we didn't have that architecture in place in a lot of countries, north and south. Um, and I think we are learning a fundamental lesson uh, that that inability to aggressively control, contain and suppress infection has to an extent led to the need for much more stringent and broader based public health and social measures and lockdowns. And we've seen in countries, and I think one of the analyses we've been doing here, we've been looking at the experience of countries and countries have been coming and working with us. 
uh, at the different combinations that, of, of responses that countries have used, from the surveillance to the community engagement to physical distancing to all of the different measures. And what appears to be uh, successful is not that every country who was successful did everything perfectly. It's that countries that have been successful have moved early and have used a combination of responses with public health surveillance at its core, case finding, tracing, testing, con uh, and those, uh, those uh, key components of public health response. And I think the lesson we need to learn everywhere, it's not what can other countries learn, even in countries who've just had a big uh, epidemic and may have a second wave at some point in the future, we need to be absolutely sure the public health surveillance architecture, the public health surveillance workforce, that these are core investments we need to make now. We don't have time uh, to wait to build a public health workforce. Uh, and we thank those countries in the South, particularly those countries in conflict, who've kept alive the concepts of contact tracing and in which we've learned and honed the techniques for doing that efficiently. Many thanks for this answer to uh, Nicola from Jeune Afrique. Uh, next question comes from Stéphane Bussard uh, from uh, L'OTAN. Stéphane? Yes, hello, thank you. Uh, I have a question for Professor Zeltner. Uh, as, as of donations and funding of the WHO Foundation, how will you make sure that uh, they will comply with the principles of WHO? Thank you. Well, uh, thank you very much for uh, that point. We, we will actually apply uh, the principles of FENSA uh, and investigate that there are no conflicts of interest from the money we receive. Uh, the second one, um, that, that's the first step we'll do. Uh, if there are um, questions and we are not sure whether uh, there may be a conflict of interest, then we actually can um, consult WHO and will uh, talk with WHO whether that is a, a donation that might be in conflict. And the, the third step actually is that, you know, we are offering a donation, a funding, an additional funding. WHO, as a matter of fact, is free to accept it or not. So even if we think everything is fine, is cleared, WHO still is in a position or the secretary to say, uh, no, we think there is a problem. So I think we have a couple of hurdles to make sure that uh, we comply with the stringent and rightly set up FENSA principles. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Zeltner, for this uh, answer. Uh, now we will go to Deutsche Welle, and we have Rosie with us. I, I he understand Rosie is not with us right now, so we will try with Economic Times India, where we have Divya. Hello, Divya. Uh, Divya, can you just unmute yourself, please? We are trying to get a connection with the Economic Times India. You would need just to click unmute. Okay, so we will may come back uh, to um, to Economic Times of India. Let's try with the Brazil now. Uh, Letizia Naisa from uh, Brazil. Hi. Hi. Uh, um, I have a question about a uh, prediction of pandemic. Since 2005, who uh, predicts that a pandemic could happen and advises members uh, to take prevention measures? Has any country followed these directions and what could have been done, especially in Brazil, which is now the epicenter of the coronavirus? I could start uh, on this and maybe uh, Mike would like to supplement or DG. Um, so yes, yeah, so, so WHO is 
um, always thinking about uh, epidemic and pandemic preparedness. It's one of the, the foundations of the work that we do. Um, we've been thinking about for a long time, and there are many um, things that we have put in place and working with through our regional offices and country offices to support member states in terms of pandemic preparedness. Um, the most obvious one is around influenza pandemic preparedness, uh, where, we, where we have uh, pandemic preparedness plans that are developed at the national level, and we work with countries to develop those plans and get systems in place uh, to be able to activate uh, for, for a novel influenza pandemic. Um, and there's a whole series of work, and this is based on decades uh, of experience with influenza, knowing what we know about that pathogen and knowing how it operates, um, and the fact that it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. Um, in addition to that, we also have a, a program of work where we're looking at emerging pathogens, um, and many of these pathogens emerge from animals. Uh, we work with uh, FAO and OIE, our partner agencies, um, to look at improving surveillance in animals. Um, we're working with them directly to look at surveillance at the animal-human interface for the possibility that there may be a new pathogen that may be detected and may spill over, meaning it, it transmits from animals to humans and that we can capture that quickly. Uh, we work with member states on the development of, of surveillance in animals, surveillance in humans, um, and preparing for uh, rapid response investigations. So it's, it's the workforce that, that we're talking about. It's this public health infrastructure and workforce ready to do these rapid investigations around the time of a potential emergence. So before this pandemic, my focal point uh, area was around MERS, um, where we were looking at within the Middle East, all of the opportunities, all of the times where this virus jumped from a camel to a human to do rapid investigations to ensure that the virus didn't have an opportunity to transmit further. Um, and we have a number of areas of work. Within our, our R&D blueprint, um, you've heard of what we call disease X, uh, which is something that was uh, coined uh, several years ago, um, where we were looking at what is going to be the next pathogen that emerges. Um, and all of these diseases in some respect are disease X, including COVID-19. And that's getting the systems in place to be able to look at the development of diagnostics, the development of therapeutics, the development of vaccines for the next pathogen. And we use our experiences with coronaviruses, with influenzas, with thinking of smallpox, think if that were to reemerge. Um, and that's the only virus that's been eradicated. Um, looking at uh, mosquito-borne uh, pathogens, looking at Zika, chikungunya, um, plague. You know, so there's a lot of things that are on our radar. Uh, COVID-19 is just one of many emerging diseases that we are constantly looking at, even today. Um, but the program of work continues. Um, and all countries, we work with all countries to build their infrastructure to be able to uh, prepare for an eventuality like this. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. Um, thank you, thank you, Marianne. I just would like to add a couple of lines. Uh, not only, you know, uh, WHO was warning about um, a, a pandemic uh, which is based on the vulnerability of our world, actually, not once, but many times, um, you know, it could be 10 years ago, five years ago, even two years ago, last year, it has been a repeated uh, reminder from WHO. But at the same time, uh, we have been working on transforming the organization. Um, as part of the transformation, which I said, which helped actually to now um, lead into the establishment of the WHO Foundation, we have been investing also in emergency preparedness. And that's why we have the first emergency preparedness division, uh, giving more attention to emergency preparedness. And it was really starting to uh, deliver. It's a new uh, division. And the second is we have established an independent body, a global preparedness monitoring board. Uh, this was in partnership with the World Bank. And the president of the World Bank and myself actually co-convene that independent board. And it's co-chaired by our former director general, Dr. Groharlem, 
and the former Secretary General of uh, IFRC, uh, Dr. Asi. And they have already released their first independent report last August with a title, The World at Risk, showing the vulnerability and the risk we have in terms of pandemics. And the report underlines that the world is not prepared. So these are the two additions from the transformation. But not only that, there, is, there are other things we have been doing, especially the focus on, on, on countries, working with countries to identify their gap, gaps in terms of preparedness, and preparing a preparedness uh, plan that can address uh, the gaps. One of the challenges we faced actually is, although many countries, more than 70 countries, have now a plan that identifies where the gaps in terms of preparedness are, but the financing uh, has not materialized. So going forward, I think the world has learned its lessons. We will make sure that the um, assessments are done again, revised, gaps are identified, and plans are prepared, and finance those plans. They shouldn't end up in, in shelves. Mm -hmm. Finance these plans and make sure that countries are better prepared to fight, to finish the current one, but to uh, prepare uh, for the next uh, epidemic, which may happen because we are still uh, vulnerable. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tedros. Uh, for this uh, next question comes from John Zaracostas. John, uh, can you please unmute? Yes, uh, yes, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, good afternoon. Uh, my question is to the professor and also perhaps to the director general. You just mentioned earlier, sir, that uh, you'll be following the principles of uh, the FENSA. Uh, I was wondering, will your MOU also require you to register as other foundations under the FENSA and be subject to the FENSA scrutiny uh, as all the other charities and foundations and non-state actors participating in WHO. Well, well thank you very much. I mean, uh, uh, you may know and some may know that I have been working actually at the FENSA regulations uh, uh, in another capacity. And um, we will, you know, our basis now is the memorandum of understanding uh, between uh, WHO and uh, the foundation. Uh, the foundation remains actually an independent legal um, entity and uh, WHO and the independent legal entity are linked by this contract we just signed. And this contract can, con can always be uh, withdrawn from WHO if they feel that the foundation is not working appropriately. In that respect, the relation between the foundation and uh, WHO is a very different one from uh, what we call, uh, you know, engagement of non-state actors. That's uh, the reason why we think that we do not have the same uh, legal quality as a non-state actor. Thank you very much, uh, Professor. Uh, now uh, we will uh, try to go back to Divya from Economic Times of India. Divya, are we having a better luck now? Hi. Yes. My name is Divya Rajkupar from the Economic Times newspaper. I wanted to check if uh, there's, there's a solidarity trial being planned for vaccines uh, on the similar lines as the solidarity drug trial. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> at this stage, there are no specific uh, vaccine trials. Uh, planned, but uh, the WHO approach is to develop uh, standard protocols for, for vaccine trials, which will allow our member states to effectively put in place the means to carry out their own trials. 
uh, using uh, various vaccine products, either pro products from their own country or from other countries. So it puts our member states back in the central position in defining, number one, the need for trials, uh, the carrying out of those trials, the regulatory and ethical process around the delivery of those trials. Taking this approach will allow countries to have comparable data, to have standardised approaches, and for WHO to invest in the, in the necessary data safety monitoring boards and oversight mechanisms and the technical, operational and scientific inputs to ensure that those trials are of the highest possible quality. So at this stage there are no trials uh, planned, uh, but it will proceed in the same way that we've proceeded with the solidarity trials for drugs, by involving uh, countries, by involving scientific institution, institutions in as many countries as possible, and thereby democratizing the process and giving countries access to the scientific knowledge, the technical platforms to be able to test vaccines on their own terms uh, within their own countries. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ryan. Uh, let's try to take a question from Will from CNBC. Uh, Will, can you hear us? Uh, yeah, can you hear me? Yes, please. Great. Please. Uh, I believe it was Monday that the WHO suspended the trial, Global Solidarity Trial of Hydroxychloroquine. Uh, President Trump uh, previously said that he was taking hydroxychloroquine to prevent infection of COVID-19 as a precaution. Uh, he's since stopped taking it, but I, my question for the WHO is whether that's advisable for our world leaders to be taking hydroxychloroquine to prevent the infection of COVID-19. Um, uh, thank you. Uh, WHO has, uh, we've said this at a previous press conference, but I think it's worth repeating. Um, we uh, do not advise the use of hydroxychloroquine or chloroquine for the treatment of COVID-19 outside randomized control trials or under uh, appropriate close clinical supervision subject to whatever national regulatory authorities have decided. So in some countries, national regulatory authorities uh, have allowed the use of the drug under close clinical supervision. Uh, from, uh, so from, from that perspective, uh, I think WHO's advice on this is clear. As you will uh, have noted from previous press conferences, uh, we've uh, temporarily uh, halted the randomization of patients into the uh, hydroxychloroquine arm of the solidarity trials, while we, uh, uh, with an abundance of caution, just check on the, the, the safety issues uh, around uh, the, the drug uh, and, and ensure that we can uh, hopefully continue with that once those checks have been done. Important again to reiterate that uh, these drugs are extremely useful drugs in the treatment and life-saving drugs in the treatment of other diseases, particularly uh, lupus and malaria as a primary use and other autoimmune disorders. It's extremely important that people on those drugs and under the appropriate clinical supervision are continuing to take their prescribed medication and continue to have access to that medication. Uh, the concern regarding hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine refers specifically to the use of this drug in the treatment of COVID-19 patients. Um, and as we said, there is no um, empirical evidence uh, that at this point that these drugs work in this case, either for treatment or for prophylaxis. But again, we look forward to the outcomes of the trials uh, when they are completed. If I could add, I won't speak to the specific questions about uh, chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine, but just to say that WHO has released updated clinical guidance today. Um, and this is a very detailed document which is aimed at medical professionals and ministries of health to advise on how to care for patients who are infected with COVID-19, whether it's mild uh, for symptomatic treatment, whether they have pneumonia, whether they have a severe disease or septic shock, and it's quite detailed. And I just thought it would be a good opportunity to mention that this will be posted today if it's not posted already right now. Um, but it is important that anyone that is seeking treatment seeks that treatment with the advice of their doctors. Um, and so while we are able to, to put out this guidance based on the latest evidence that we have, um, and as Mike has said, we don't have any specific treatments yet, but these clinical trials are underway, um, there is advice that we do provide for ministries of health and medical professionals all over the world. Thank you very much. Uh, we have time for one or two more questions, so let's go to uh, Agence France Presse, uh, Agnès Pedrero. Agnès? Yes, hello, do you hear me? Yes. Bonsoir, je vais poser la... 
Good evening. I'd like to ask my question in French. Uh, thank you for giving me the floor. I wanted to know, it's a question for the WHO. I'd like to know what you think about the theory of uh, crossed uh, immunity uh, with other coronaviruses which could protect against the SARS-CoV-2. This was a hypothesis that came up recently with American researchers. Uh, I would like to know what you think of this theory. Um, Maria will give you a more detailed answer as to the cross-protection of uh, other coronavirus infections uh, with regard to uh, COVID-19. Uh, there is uh, certainly uh, some evidence uh, with regard to T-cells that if you have a previous coronavirus infection, you may be able to mount a more rapid response to uh, COVID-19. But there is no empirical evidence that previous coronavirus infections protect you from infection with COVID-19. The jury is still very much out on that. But it is interesting to note that, at least in some of the studies, that if we're getting a more broad-based T-cell response, there's more hope then for vaccines and others producing a more long-term immune response. Uh, so for me, this information is very important. It gives us hope that we're getting the kinds of immune responses that may be helpful for long-term protection. Uh, and may also mean that uh, vaccines have a broader protection. But Maria may have more technical detail on the cross-protection issues, because much experience with SARS and MERS and, and other coronavirus. Thanks, Mike. So yes, no, I mean, this is, this is welcomed news to see this type of research and to see that there are specific studies that are looking at a T-cell response. Um, there are a number of, of, of assays that are out there that are looking at the immune response, look, measuring you know, different elements of that immune response, including neutralizing antibodies, T-cell response. Most of the serologic assays that are commercially available um, are not looking at a T-cell response. They're looking at um, IgM, IgG, um, not even neutralizing antibodies. The assays that can do that are more specialized labs. Um, and so what WHO is doing in our support for seroepidemiology globally to really understand the immune response, to understand the extent of infection, is, is, a, is a three different things. One is we are working with um, collaborating laboratories globally um, who have experiences with coronaviruses and with FIND um, to, to evaluate the serologic assays that are out there, that are available. How well do they work? What are they measuring and how well do they measure that? And that is something that is ongoing. You've heard me speak about before. Um, the second thing that we're doing is we are working uh, with um, several uh, researchers globally um, and also NIBSC in the UK to develop an international serum panel, um, which, we are, which we have recently shipped to a number of labs across the globe to be able to validate and evaluate the assays that are out there and to come up with a standardized serologic assay. Again, that is also in development. And the third thing that we're doing is we've provided these core protocols, similar to the core protocol that we, we have for the solidarity trial. These are for seroepidemiologic investigations. And we're working with countries to look at um, the extent of infection as measured by these antibodies. From the available studies that we have, um, there's two published studies and there's more than 20 that are available in preprint, and in many, uh, we've received some results through press release. Um, we haven't fully been able to evaluate the assays. Mm -hmm. And one of the important things is to look at the cross reactivity with other coronaviruses and see if, if that is a factor in uh, the immune response that people have. So this is something that is under development. Um, but yes, so the, the results from the T cell and is, is welcomed news, and we know that there are a number of labs that are additionally looking at that as well. Thank you very much for this. We will conclude this press briefing here uh, with a special thanks to our special guest, Professor uh, Zeltner. We will have an audio file sent to you uh, very soon and transcript will be posted tomorrow as well as a number of uh, announcements and news from different WHO regions and country offices. I wish everyone a very nice evening. Thank you. Thank you, Tariq, and thank you, Professor, for joining us, and uh, thank you to all online who have joined today. Thank you so much. See you on Friday.